It's baffled scholars for two millennia. It is a puzzle made of multi-dimensional elements, an enigma with roots that reach back to the dawning of time, perhaps before. Daniel explained part of it. Ezekiel and Isaiah had glimpses into it. John saw it all for the time of the end. That time is now. Join Derek and Sharon Gilbert on a journey that spans the course of history, from Eden to Mount Hermon, from Hermon to Babel, from Babel to Rome, from Rome to the cross, and from there to us. Biblical prophecy is coming true before your eyes, and to understand it, you must discern the times both then and now. It's time to unravel the threads of this all-encompassing prophetic paradox. It's time to unravel Revelation. Welcome to Unraveling Revelation from Skywatch TV. I'm Derek Gilbert. I am Mrs. Derek Gilbert, and I love saying that. I'm Sharon Gilbert, and we are delighted that you are following this study that really looks at all prophecy in the Bible and how it all interconnects. We are... Um we know we said we were going to talk about the Ten Kings as we've been going through uh, sort of comparing the, the man of sin, the I Antichrist, know. the beast. But, but I think uh, given what's going on in over, over in Ukraine and a lot of prophecy teachers who are honing in on this, I think it's important that we address what our interpretation is. And I, I think that it's not ours alone. Others think this too. Um, What's going on with Russia? Mm -hmm. And that may take us a couple of weeks. So I'm thinking those 10 kings may not be for a little while. <laughs> yes. Um, yeah, it, it appears the world or the God of this world had other plans as far as our schedule goes, because we certainly want to address something that is very timely now as we're recording this. Now, by the time this makes it to air, it's very likely that the situation on the ground will be changed. So we're not going to deal with any specifics of what's happening in Russia and Ukraine, other than to just say... Pray for the people mm -hmm. of Ukraine and Please of do. Russia because there are many soldiers finding themselves in a situation they didn't expect to be in because and of the command of their uh, their commanding officer, in this case, Vladimir Putin. Yes, and there are many, many people in Russia who disagree with what's going on, yes. and they're being arrested, and many of them are having to flee okay. Russia, Russia, so please pray for those individuals as well. Pray for Vladimir Putin. Wouldn't it be wonderful oh, yes. if he actually saw the truth and accepted Christ as his Savior? Yes, um, and, and there's some thought that he may th see this as kind of a holy quest because Kiev in Russia's national psyche is sort of a spiritual center. Um, it was really where the first Russian kingdom was established. It's the Mm -hmm. It's where the Russian Orthodox Church began. It and goes back so to it, the belief that the Tsar is the Holy Roman Emperor. Right, right. And uh, while we hold no truck with that, we don't, you know, accept that. But that may be what's in what's in Mr. Putin's mind. What we can't know for certain what's in his heart. That's for the Lord to decide. Mm -hmm. But we can certainly petition the Holy Spirit, petition our Lord and Savior to intercede for those people. And we do. And yes. as we said, as Derek said, by the time you're watching this, many, many things in Ukraine may have changed. We'll talk about a few things that are going on to now and what we think is going to happen ahead of the game. But uh, the bottom line is that this may be the fulfillment of at least one aspect of the Gog Magog War, and I'll explain what I mean by that. Oh, ah, okay, bit. all right. Well, anytime Russia gets involved in a uh, military operation, and we've seen this a couple of times, several times now in our lives. I mean, uh, Russia in and crushing the the rebellion in the Czech Republic, or Czechoslovakia at mm -hmm. the time, uh, back in the '60s. Um, Russia's involvement with other conflicts around the world, mm -hmm. Chechnya, uh, Syria. Chechnya, Syria, taking the Crimea in 2014. Yes. So many of these uh, incidents lead to speculation. And um, in fact, since 2015, it's really increased from Orthodox and ultra-Orthodox rabbis in, in, in Israel that we are on the, we are in, the, the Messiah's arrival will be imminent. Now for Jews, it would be his arrival. For us as Christians, of course, we understand his return. Yes. But they see Russia as Gog of Magog. They do. And some rabbis are teaching that Messiah is already here. Yes, yes. Well, we, we want don't to, believe that. No, we don't. Uh, we <laughs> haven't want to seen the Mount that. of Olives split in two, so don't think he's here. Exactly. But there is an interesting aspect of their belief regarding the War of Gog and Magog that I think is accurate, and that is that the War of Gog and Magog is the great war 
that ends this age before God's literal return, Christ's return to the earth. You know, it just occurred to me that Tom Horn has been teaching for a long time that the year 2012 Mm -hmm. didn't quite go the way we expected it to, but I think something happened in 2012 that opened the doorway for a lot of spiritual activity. You you may well be right, and certainly... Sorry, my cable's just a little little funny here. Yeah. Um, anyway, um, not that I'm laughing. <laughs> the uh, the year 2025 appears to be very significant too, and we've seen this in um, uh, some of Tom's writings. Mm-hmm. We see it in the uh, uh, I'd say coincidence, but I'm not a coincidence theorist. With uh, the arrival of Apophis in 2029, the asteroid Apophis. Mm-hmm. But Josh Peck, in his research into the writings of the uh, the the Essenes at Qumran, pointed to the year 2025 as mm-hmm. especially significant, the beginning of the end of the age. Absolutely, so, Josh Peck has a great book about that, as mm-hmm. does uh, Dr. Ken Johnson. Dr. Ken Johnson, right. thank you very much. So, what is their belief? Well, again, that Gog, Magog, that Gog is the great end times enemy of God and Israel, and we agree with that because yes. Gog. Gog is the Old Testament form of the Antichrist. Mm -hmm. And we're going to dig into this and explain why we believe that Gog is the Antichrist and why the land of Magog is not Russia over the course of the next couple of... uh, And I'm going to explain why that's a red herring. Ah, yes. Pun intended. Yeah, we are playing checkers while the enemy is playing chess. Thankfully, and the Lord, our Lord is playing three-dimensional yeah. or 11-dimensional oh, chess. No, he's playing infinite dimensional <laughs> Sideways chess. Sideways eight. Yeah. So Ezekiel 38, beginning at verse one, reads this. The word of that Yahweh came to me, son of man, and that is a phrase that just means human one, set your face toward Gog of the land of Magog, the chief prince of Meshech and Tubal, and prophesy against him and say, thus says the Lord Yahweh, behold, I am against you, O Gog, chief prince of Meshech and Tubal, and I will turn you about and put hooks into your jaws, and I will bring you out and all your army, horses and horsemen, all of them clothed in full armor, a great host, all of them with buckler and shield, wielding swords. Persia, Cush, and Put are with them, all of them with shield and helmet. Gomer and all his hordes, Beth to Garma from the uttermost parts of the north with all his hordes, many peoples are with you. Now, we'll stop there because this identifies the enemy army Mm -hmm. in this great end times battle. And there are a couple of things in here that lead some to interpret this as a prophecy of a coalition led by Russia, also to include Iran, uh, Ethiopia, Mm -hmm. and or Sudan and Libya in in this coalition. Um, We don't think that that's what Ezekiel is pointing to here. And here's why. Uh, First, the two things, the two clues that lead to the conclusion or lead some to conclude that Russia is in view here. First, that uh, verse 2 reads, Son of man, set your face toward Gog of the land of Magog, the chief prince of Meshach and Tubal. The word translated chief in Ezekiel 38, verse 2, and again in um, verse, uh, or is it verse 3 again, um, is Rosh. Mm-hmm. I've been practicing to get that role in the art. Very good. Yeah. Rosh. Beginning in the 19th century, a couple of renowned scholars of Hebrew, uh, Wilhelm Gesenius, who died in the 1840s, 1848, I believe, and uh, C.F. Kyle. Uh, Kyle and Delitzsch wrote a, a commentary in the Old Testament that was published in 1861. Gesenius' lexicon was published in 1847. It was actually after his death. He died mm-hmm. in 1842. And Gesenius wrote this. Rosh was a designation for the tribes then north of the Taurus Mountains, that's uh, in Turkey, dwelling in the neighborhood of the Volga, a river in Russia. Mm -hmm. Also that Rosh in Ezekiel 38 and 39 is a northern nation mentioned with Meshach and Tubal, undoubtedly the Russians who are mentioned by the Byzantine writers of the 10th century under the name the Rosh, dwelling north of the Taurus as dwelling on the river Volga. Mm -hmm. Now, Gesenius was pointing to Byzantine writers. Now, bear in mind that the Byzantines, or Eastern Roman Empire, was extinguished in 1453. He's pointing to them writing in the 900s AD about a uh, tribe called the Rus. They were Varangians. They were Mm -hmm. Swedes. They Mm -hmm. were Vikings who had come down from Scandinavia and settled around Kiev, which is, again, why we say the kingdom of Russia began at Kiev. That's almost 1,600 years after Ezekiel wrote his prophecy. Yes, I I agree with you there. And I think that Gesenius um, is writing from 
his perspective at the time because yes. beginning yes. in the late 18th century, Russia became a pariah to the other nations. It, it did. Gesenius and Kyle both were Prussian. Today we would say German, mm -hmm. but uh, by the 18, middle of the 19th century, Russia and Prussia had fought mm -hmm. a couple of wars. Mm -hmm. This was in the era of the Crimean conflict, in fact, the Crimean War. <laughs> that, that was in the 1840s. So you've got Russia coming down to claim all of that area when the West said, no, you don't have a right to that area. Boy, this history repeats itself. Mm -hmm. Then they lost at Sevastopol. No one won in the Crimean War. Right. No one did. It was, it a, was a terrible war. And uh, Russia was seen as the enemy. Pogroms against the Jews happened shortly after that and against other people groups, including the gypsies. And uh, Russia became, to the West, the great enemy. Yeah. And there was something called the Great Game, or the game Tournament of Shadows, that was taking place between the West, which essentially was led by the United Kingdom at the time, and Russia. Mm -hmm. And that... Uh intensified after 1917 when the Bolshevik Revolution took place. Mm -hmm. Schofield's study Bible, and I'm not besmirching the I Schofield love Schofield. Study Bible. Yeah. I love uh, it. There are some who are very critical of Schofield, and, and we're not among them. But Schofield did write that Russia was clearly the um, nation in view mm -hmm. as Roche. Uh, and, and in fact, the NASB translation to this day, instead of Chief Prince of Meshach and Tubal, mm -hmm. says Chief uh, Prince of Rosh Meshach and Tubal. Yeah. Uh, again, that is just not the case. It was easier to understand, to interpret Russia as the great enemy mm -hmm. uh, after the Bolsheviks in 1917, and especially after World War II when the Cold War uh, became sort of the dominant political narrative of the 1950s and 60s here in the United States. Well, let me help move people away from that naturalistic explanation and a an explanation that goes along with the current geopolitical thought. What if all of these are spirit-led humans? Well, I think that's... And he's addressing it not just to the humans but and about the humans, but mainly the spirits that are behind them, the princes of those linguistic tribes. Remember what Paul says. We wrestle not against flesh and blood. Right. Yes, exactly. And, and I think there's a good reason for that, too, and we'll get to that when we talk about the uttermost north, which is mm -hmm. the other clue here that people use when they want to... Uh, designate and, and look to Rosh as uh, mm -hmm. evidence that we're talking about Russia. Obviously, when you draw a line north on a map from Jerusalem, the farthest most north you get is Russia. So mm -hmm. uttermost north, it kind of makes sense from a geographic standpoint. But that phrase in Ezekiel 38 that translates as um, the, the uttermost north is uh, not a geographic reference. No. It is, in fact, a spiritual reference. And uh, I'm going to bring up my notes here again because I switched my layout unintentionally. Uh, the word, the phrase in Hebrew is Yarkate Sephon, and it is only Yishai found. Yeshai would be proud of you. Yeah, right? <laughs> yes, sorry. Yeshai was our travel guide in Israel. I had to ask him how to pronounce that because. Uh, yeah, and, and three or four times he'd come over and whisper. No, it's Yarkate. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, Yarkate it only appears in really three places in the Bible. The first place, obviously, is Ezekiel 38 and 39, where we see it several places, talking about how this horde from the north is coming from the uttermost parts of the north. Mm -hmm. The second place is in Psalm 48, which is a comparison between God's holy mountain and this other location. And it's really an interesting comparison because, and I'll just read it, great is, the, great is Yahweh, great is the Lord, and greatly to be praised in the city of our God. His holy mountain, beautiful in elevation, is the joy of all the earth. Mount Zion in the far north, the city of the great king. That's just Psalm 48, verses 1 and 2. Now, first Zion's of all, not the north. Well, that, that's the thing. It's, it's also, you know, it says beautiful in elevation. It's not even the tallest hill in it's, Jerusalem. It's almost a valley. Yeah, it's uh, 200 feet shorter than the Mount of Olives. So mm -hmm. it's not about its height. And Mount Zion here refers to the Temple Mount, but uh, the, the the line in verse 2, Mount Zion in the far north, when this psalm was written probably 3,000 years ago, even back then, without Google Maps, they understood that Mount Zion, the Temple Mount, was not in the far north. They couldn't Google it? They couldn't. <gasps> they actually had to look. They had, My had, might have had a scroll with a map written on it, but they knew that it was not in the far north. They knew that the Canaanites lived up there and the Hittites and then some other barbarian peoples lived up that way. They knew it wasn't in the far north. In the Hebrew, that, that line actually reads, Hart 
Tzayon, Yarkate Tzephon. It's almost a wordplay. So he's comparing Mount Zion with this other place called mm -hmm. Zephon, mm -hmm. Zion, Zephon. The other place we see it is in Isaiah chapter 14, which is that famous chapter with the line, How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, mm -hmm. son of the morning? And that is where we find the clue as to what this actually means. And we can, I think, maybe expand on that. Oh, yes, we that. need to take a break, don't we? Yeah, but we'll tell you what the connection is between Zion and uh, Lucifer when Unraveling Revelation continues. Thousands of years ago, giants walked the earth. They are long gone, but their spirits remain. The evidence is there for those with eyes to see. Megalithic tombs, monuments aligned with the stars, and the words of the prophets and apostles recorded in scripture. Now, see this evidence for yourself as Derek and Sharon Gilbert take you on a tour of the Holy Land with special guests, Pastor Carl Gallops and Messianic Rabbi Zev Porad from the mountain where the story began to the mountain where it all ends. Wars of the Gods, Volume 2, Search for the Rephaim. Available now in DVD and HD streaming video online at gilberthouse.org. Welcome back to Unraveling Revelation from Skywatch TV. I'm Derek Gilbert. I am Sharon Gilbert, and go get your tea if you don't oh, have yeah. any already. And uh, plan to join us in Turkey. We're going there mm -hmm. in October of this year, 2022. And you can find out all about it at skywatchinturkey.com. And we're going to visit some places. Our tour of Turkey is going to be so extraordinary. The guy who runs the actual tour company, is coming with us because he said, you've got the best <laughs> list of sites. Yes, Doug Hershey, who's the author of the best-selling coffee table book, Israel Rising, is the founder of Ezra Adventures, which normally runs tours to Israel, but during COVID, they were locked down. Turkey didn't require and still does not require a vaccine. So uh, Turkey's more friendly, and yes. they love Westerners. Yes, so he's coming with us because we're, we've got some sites that he has not been to in the eastern part of the country that relate to biblical history, Old Testament history in particular. We'll see Abraham's hometown of Haran. We'll visit the sites of the churches of Revelation, mm -hmm. visit the Plutonion, the gates of hell. Oh my goodness. Yes. And uh, Antioch, where Christians were first called by that name. Yes. We'll be at Ephesus. We're going to all of the seven churches of the book of Revelation, but we're also going to uh, um, Gobekli Tepe. Gobekli Tepe. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. And we are also going to Israel next year in March of 2023. So if you want to go to that, go to the website skywatchinisrael.com. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. If you've got a smartphone or tablet with a camera on it, you can point it at the QR code <gasps> on the screen. A QR code for both of them? Yeah, I've got one oh. for uh, the one that's already off screen, but the one for Israel on the screen now. And you yeah. can use that. That'll take you right to the website. Uh, both sites have itineraries, breakdown of costs, and places to register. So uh, join us as we tour and teach through the lands of the Bible. And uh, we, we pray that we see you there. Um, we do. And uh, if not, boy, we'll be coming back with lots of videos. So we we'll will be indeed. sharing that in the so, in months and years ahead. Isaiah so, 14. Isaiah 14. Interestingly, Antakya or Antioch is very near this mountain, which uh, in ancient times was called Har Tzaphon or Mount Tzaphon, mm -hmm. which uh, in Hebrew means um, Mount of the North or Mount North. And the reason it's the uh, word in Hebrew for the compass point north is because this is where Baal's palace was located. Everyone ah. in the ancient world knew that Baal's palace, built with gold and silver and fire, located on Mount Tzaphon. But it was so important that the other cultures in the area also, also considered it sacred to their version of Baal, their version of the storm god. Mm -hmm. For the Hurrians, that was Teshub. For the, the Hittites, it was uh, Tarhunta. They called it uh, Mount uh, Hatzia. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the, uh, the Romans called it Mount Kazios. The, uh, the, the Greeks knew about it. They believe that Zeus, their version of Baal, fought a war against the storm, or not the 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 chaos monster Typhon, mm -hmm. whose name derives from Mount Zephon. Mount Zephon, exactly. So this was so important in the Hebrew mind that the name of the mountain became their word for north. In other Hebrew Semitic, Semitic languages, the word is Samal. So, so if Gog and this whole coalition are coming from the uttermost north, coming from that mountain, right, coming right. from that. Uh, assembly of fallen entities, right. then who's Gog? 
Well, again, I point. I believe this points to Gog being the Antichrist. In other words, Satan's commander in chief. Now, in Matthew 12 and Revelation 2, Christ's letter to Pergamum, he identifies the storm god Zeus, Baal, as Satan. Connects him to Satan. So this is Satan's mount of assembly, and that's another phrase that's very important because the Hebrew phrase "mount of assembly" or "mount of the congregation" Har Moed is the Hebrew behind the word Armageddon. Yeah, it's a mistranslation. It's going back from Hebrew to Greek and then back again. Yeah, and uh, so we English speakers assume it's pointing to Megiddo. Megiddo is 50 miles from Jerusalem. Har Moed is God's mount of assembly, which yes. is the Temple Mount, Zion. It's the place that makes the most sense exactly. that the enemy wants that spot. Has right. wanted it all along. And God prophesies this. We see it in Zechariah 12, Zechariah 14, Joel chapter 3. The whole world is coming to do battle at Jerusalem. Well, let me back so up a little bit. So this is a supernatural bit. war. Let me back up a little bit and just explain something that you mentioned earlier. You were talking about this Yarakate Tzephon, mm -hmm. the Mount of Baal, being called Mount Zion. Well, it's it's being compared to Mount Zion. Yes. Yeah. It's called Zion of the North. Yes. Har now, let Zion. me just give you yeah. my theory on that. The Lord also claimed Mount Hermon. Yes, And he Mount did. Sinai, the mountain of the moon god. Yes. In other words, he says, all of these mountains that you're claiming, they're all mine. Mm. I'm taking over all of your territory. That's, you know, that's really, that. yes, you're right. This idea that we're dealing with a cosmic north, mm -hmm. because Mount Hermon mm -hmm. was also north of Israel. Uh -huh. It's uh, on the border between Israel, Lebanon, and Syria to this day. Well, Sinai wasn't. Sinai wasn't, but God comes from Sinai. Yes. And and he's doing battle in with... In Psalm 68, we see this, this beginning at verse 15, O mountain of God, mountain of Bashan. Bashan is that region around Mount Hermon. And as Mike Heiser points out, this uh, phrase in, in verse 15, Har... Uh, Har Elohim, Har Bashan. Uh, Har Elohim can be a mountain of God or mountain of the gods. It's the mount of the assembly of the gods, right. and it's either a divine one, which is the Lord God Almighty's mm -hmm. assembly, or it's an infernal one. Exactly. Which I believe is in the underworld. Yes. Uh, so we've got this many peaked mountain, mountain of Bashan, um, so named because. Hermon is just the highest peak in a chain of mountains, mm -hmm. the anti-Lebanon mountains. Why do you look with hatred, O many peaked mountain, at the mount that God desired for his abode? Yes, where Yahweh will dwell forever. That's Mount Zion, the Temple mm -hmm. Mount in Jerusalem. The chariots of God are twice 10,000, thousands upon thousands. The Lord is among them. Sinai is now in the sanctuary. The Net Bible um, re renders it this way. Uh, the Lord comes from Sinai in holy splendor. So uh, it is basically, he's led an army from Mount Sinai. This is uh, referring back to Israel coming from Sinai to mm -hmm. Canaan, God leading the charge. It may be a future fulfillment, though, and this is really speculative. But there are some, and I sort of am in that camp, there are some who believe that when the, the, the remnant of those in Jerusalem who flee mm -hmm. during the middle of the last seven years of life as we know it, yes. the tribulation period, that they may be uh, protected in Petra. Yes. And if that is true, there are those who believe that Jesus will actually be there with them in spirit and that he will lead them back. Mm -hmm. And he's bringing captives and that spirit captives with him. Yes. The Lord is going to smack down. Verse 18, you ascended on high, leading a host of captives in your train and receiving gifts among men, even among the rebellious, that Yahweh God, that the Lord God may dwell there. This also may refer back to a couple of different events. You've also speculated that this might refer to the transfiguration. When mm -hmm. Jesus took three disciples and climbed Mount Hermon, mm -hmm. the only high mountain near Caesarea Philippi, and was transfigured into a being of light, basically claiming that territory. But it may also be the reason that God had Moses go first against Og of Bashan yes. to take out the last of the remnant of the Rephaim before going back south. This was a journey that from mm -hmm. Jericho to Og of Bashan's territory probably took a month. So two months out of their way, not counting the time it took to fight the battles with Sahon of Heshbon mm -hmm. and uh, Og of Bashan, God said, we have to go there first. And while Moses and the Israelites are fighting in Bashan, he was on Mount Hermon leading a train of captives away. 
Mount Hermon? Which oversees Bashan, O Mountain of Bashan, the Many Peak Mountain of Bashan. If that's what you were talking about, I'm, I'm confused because you've got the Transfiguration and the Old Testament events in the same moment. Multiple fulfillments of the Oh, prophecy. I agree with that, but I do think that when the Lord appeared on Mount Hermon, he was appearing in the fallen realm's other world assembly. You have to understand that our world is far beyond what we can see, and there are many or, uh, uh, civilizations that do not call it the underworld. We tend to think beneath the earth. Mm -hmm. They call it the other world, yeah. which means that it's just beyond our eyesight. Mm -hmm. So I think he, has, he not only appeared on Mount Hermon suddenly, hey, look, I'm here transfigured and I brought a couple of guys with me mm -hmm. that I've resurrected. I'm just showing you that I'm resurrecting my people and you're not going to be resurrected. I think the same thing happened when the Lord God Almighty appeared on Sinai. Mm -hmm. He was in the middle of this, the moon gods. And their assembly. council, right, yes. And then later on, he's appearing on on uh, Yadika, on, on Safon. Mm -hmm. And over and over and over, he's taking over their territory right. and saying to them, you are not going to win. Exactly. And this refers to Psalm 82, which in our ESV translation reads, God has taken his place in the divine council in the midst of the gods. He holds yes. judgment. At verse six and seven, I said, you are gods, sons of the most high, all of you. Nevertheless, like men, you shall die and fall like any prince. God decrees the, the death of these gods. But the phrase translated to fine counsel is a dot L. Mm -hmm. And the New English translation renders it this way, which is really intriguing. God stands in the assembly of L, yes. the creator God of the Canaanite pantheon. Which may be the Mount Hermon transfiguration. Exactly. So God appears in the midst of the infernal council yes. and passes judgment. Can you just imagine that? They're all gathered together with their even little plans and mm -hmm. schemes, and suddenly the Lord himself appears and says, okay... How long are you going to rule unjustly? Oh. I asked you to take over, you know, ruling the earth for me as part of my divine counsel, carrying out my will, and you have rebelled. Mm -hmm. So though you are gods, all of you, sons of the Most High, nevertheless, like men you shall die and fall like any prince. And, uh, of course, that psalm concludes with the wonderful cl uh, the call, Arise, O God, judge the earth for you shall inherit all the nations. Oh, amen. And that is what we're looking forward to. That is to. what we want. Well, we haven't talked much about politics. We'll get to that next week. So uh, just hang in there. Oh, yes. We've got more. Gog and Magog is uh, one of the most enduring mysteries of Bible prophecy, and uh, we won't claim to have all of the answers. We'll do the best we can, and we thank you for watching as we untangle all of this. That's why we call it Unraveling Revelation. Unraveling Revelation is a viewer-supported outreach of Gilbert House Ministries. Follow us online at unravelingrevelation.tv and gilberthouse.org. That's where you'll find our weekly Bible study, the Gilbert House Fellowship. Join us as we study the Bible every week, verse by verse, in chronological order. We'd love to hear from you. Contact us through our websites or drop us a line at P.O. Box 78, Crane, Missouri, 65633.